Good morning. I welcome you to this session of fluid machines. Uh, last class we discussed uh, the Francis runner and the force exerted by the fluid on the Francis runner and the power developed. Also we developed an expression for specific speed of Francis runner mainly in terms of the angles of the guide vanes at the exit and the angle inlet angle of the runner blade. The usual values or the typical values that cover the actual case for a Francis turbine are like that. The alpha 1 which we already noted that it is the outlet angle of the guide blades usually varies from 10 degree to 40 degree. We must know these values in practice. The beta 1 that is the inlet blade angle which varies from 45 degree to 120 degree with respect to a typical blade of a Francis runner. So, this is beta 1. So, this angle is beta 1. Well, the ratio of width to diameter at the inlet B by D which is very important in determining the flow velocity V f determining the flow velocity V f which remains constant throughout the flow to the runner blades which varies from a value of 120 to 2 third. These are the typical ranges between which the pertinent geometrical dimensions are kept and the combinations of this cover a wide range of specific speed NS for the turbines from 40 to 500. Very wide range of specific speeds covered by a Francis turbine, radial flow reaction turbines. Now, as the specific speed increases mainly beyond 500, what happens is that the head under which the runner is working is getting reduced. So, therefore, essential feature of a <coughs> turbo machine at a higher specific speed that means at a lower head is that you should admit a relatively large amount of flow to get some definite work output. So, therefore, the runner should be capable of handling or allowing a more amount of flow to get a definite work output when it is operating at a very lower rate or a higher specific speed. And this for to meet this requirement the shape of the runner blades have to be changed and the type of the runner also changes. For a maximum flow through the runner the flow velocity has to be axial that means if the flow rate through the runner blade has to be made very high the flow velocity has to be axial. That means, the direction of the flow velocity should be parallel to the direction of the uh, parallel to the axis of rotation. And to do this and to accommodate the flow and to extract the work from the fluid flowing through the runner, the shape of the runner blades have to be changed. So, this is accomplished in a machine known as axial flow turbine, axial flow turbine. And a machine of this type axial flow turbine was first turbine sorry axial flow turbine was first developed by an Austrian engineer Victor Kaplan and that is why the name of this turbine is Kaplan turbine according to the name of the scientist Kaplan turbine. So, Kaplan turbine is specifically an axial flow reaction turbine which is used for a very high specific speed range beyond this 500 at max higher efficiency. So, let us look what looks like a typical axial flow turbine or the Kaplan turbine which is sometimes known as a propeller, a propeller or Kaplan turbine. You see these are the guide vanes. So, fluid while after passing through the guide vanes, the pipe bends are such, the ducts are such, it is bent at right angles in the axial direction. So, it first enters to the guide vane almost in a radial direction as it happens also in case of a Francis turbine. Then it is turned to right angle to the axial direction. So, these are the rotor blades or the runner of the turbine or so, this is the shaft. Usually those machines have vertical shaft. So, if we look a plan view, so the runner blade looks like this. The numbers of runner blades are usually small. So, here what happens the fluid flows parallel to the axis of rotation throughout the runner. 
which means the entry is axial, the exit is also axial. Now, I have mentioned earlier also the purpose of the guide vanes is to direct the fluid accordingly to the runner blades and also to impart a little amount of pre wheel that means a tangential component of velocity to the fluid. Now, the tangential velocity in the fluid approaching the runner is such that it can be approximated by a free vortex motion. Why? If we neglect the friction in this duct, then we can say that in absence of friction and when no work is done or extracted from the fluid, then the tangential velocity if there is any follows a free vortex type of motion, which means the tangential velocity decreases with the increase in radius. But what happens to the blade velocities? The blade velocities increases with the increase in radius because it is a solid body rotation. So, to take care of this different relationship between the fluid velocity and the blade velocity, typically the tangential velocities, the tangential velocity of the fluid approaching the blade and the blade velocity, linear blade velocity, blades are made twisted. Twisted means the blade angles from inlet, that means the root, not inlet, I will tell the root to the tip is varying. This is known as twisted blades. These blades are made, made twisted, twisted blades, twisted blades, twisted blades. The blades are made twisted. So, the flow takes place axially, almost axial through the blade. A typical peripheral section of the blade is like this. Now, if you draw the velocity triangle here, you see that the velocity triangle is like this usually. The most important feature is that flow velocity, that means this is the rotor speed u, this is the v r 1 and this is the inlet velocity. This is the flow velocity v f which is axial here. That means, in reaction tur turbine radial flow, we have seen the inlet that means either with respect to blade or the absolute velocity was in radial and tangential plane, then it has both radial component and tangential component. In case of an axial flow turbine, it is other way, it has got tangential component, this is the tangential component V w 1 and an axial component which is the flow velocity V f 1. The outlet velocity triangle, if you draw, will be the same as that of a radial flow reaction turbine this V f 2 is equal to V f 1, which is equal to V a, that means the axial velocity of flow. And this is typically, sorry, this is this direction, this is the u and this is the V r 2. One important thing is that the blade velocity is same at both inlet and outlet. In my diagram also, it does not look like that, their lengths are not same because they are same, because they are in the same axial they are in the same radial location, that means the flow is in axial direction. So, radial location at inlet and radial location on outlet is the same. So, this is the principal feature of a uh, axial flow turbine, the blades are twisted and the flow is throughout the axial. The main feature is that in this case, the flow velocity is much higher as compared to that in the radial flow reaction turbine and the flow velocity is here in the axial direction because the main flow is in the axial direction. So, this way this turbine is capable of handling a very high flow rate and therefore, it is suitable for a lower head or a higher specific speed at higher specific speed, higher specific speed. The runner runs full completely filled with the liquid, so that the reaction is imparted on the liquid and moreover the degree, the degree of reaction in this type of machine is higher than that in case of a radial flow Francis turbine. Well, after this now I will go to the uh, discussion on draft tube, application of draft tube. Now, I have already told earlier that a draft tube is attached always to the outlet of the runner of a reaction turbine to minimize the energy loss at the outlet. Now, at the outlet end of the runner of a reaction turbine, the kinetic energy which is coming out is loss. So, if the fluid comes with a very high velocity, that means the loss in 
energy in terms of the kinetic energy of the fluid is very high. So, therefore, what happens is that a divergent duct is attached to the outlet end of the runner of the reaction turbine, so that the velocity of the fluid is reduced. That means, a decelerating flow is caused in the divergent tube. As you know, when the fluid flows through a divergent duct, as the area of cross section increases, its velocity decreases. So, therefore, at the outlet end, the velocity of the fluid gets reduced and therefore, the rejection of energy at the extreme outlet of the machine is very less. In another look, we can see, we can see from another a point that we have already discussed earlier or seen that if you write the energy equation or the Bernoulli's equation between the inlet to the draft tube that means the exit of the runner and the final exit of the draft tube, we see that since the discharge from the draft tube is at atmospheric pressure and moreover the flow through the draft tube is a decelerating flow that means velocity is decreased. So, therefore, the pressure at the upstream part that means, for example, at the inlet of the draft tube is be lower than the atmospheric pressure because pressure has to increase for decelerating the flow, which means in other way the outlet end of the runner is running at a lower is running with a lower or a suction pressure in comparison to that of a runner without a draft tube. So, therefore, the effective head across the runner is increased by attaching the draft tube. This can be looked from this angle also. The draft tube reduces the pressure at the runner outlet. So, this is the precise principle of a draft tube, how it increase the head across the runner. Now, therefore, you see that the purpose of the draft tube is to reduce the energy at the outlet and thus to increase the head across the runner. Now, two things have to be kept in mind while designing the draft tube. Now, you see draft tube is a divergent duct. First thing is that when we extract more energy in the draft tube, that means how do you extract energy? That means we reduce the loss at the outlet or we reduce the pressure at the outlet end of the runner. To do that, we will have to keep in mind that the loss of energy while flowing through the loss of energy of the liquid while flowing through the duct tube should be as small as possible. So, what are the sources of error? One source of error is the usual friction loss, that is the friction between the fluid and the solid wall or between the fluid to fluid. Another source of error comes while a fluid flows through a divergent duct is the loss due to boundary layer separation. Do you know what is that? The loss due to boundary layer separation? Do you know it? Well, now what happens when the fluid flows through a duct of cross uniform cross sectional area or fluid flows through a duct of converging cross sectional area that means either fluid flows with uniform velocity or fluid flows with increasing velocity an accelerating flow loss which is incurred is only due to friction that means between fluid to fluid that is fluid viscosity and fluid to solid friction. But when the fluid flows through a divergent duct then another additional loss comes, loss in head, the loss in total energy is known as boundary layer separation. What happens is that when the fluid flows through a divergent duct, you see the flow is a decelerating type. That means according to continuity, when the cross sectional area increases, the flow velocity decreases. In compliance with the Bernoulli's equation, the pressure increases. When the velocity decreases, the pressure increases. That means, fluid flows against an adverse pressure gradient. That means, fluid flows from a lower pressure to a higher pressure. So, why the fluid flows? Yes, the fluid does not flow from a higher pressure to lower pressure. That is not the nature's law. Nature's law is that fluid flows from higher energy to lower energy. So, fluid is capable of flowing from a lower pressure to higher pressure because its energy at the lower pressure condition, that means, at the upstream condition is more than the downstream condition. Then only the fluid is capable to overcome this adverse pressure in. But what happens for the fluid which is very near to the solid wall? As you know, the influence of solid to the fluid gives rise to the formation of a boundary layer or what happens is that due to the frictional interaction between the solid and the fluid, it is the consequence of the fluid viscosity that the fluid particles near the wall loses its velocity and in fact, at the solid wall fluid velocity is 0 if the solid surface is at rest. That means, no slip condition. You know from your basic knowledge in fluid mechanics that the relative velocity between this fluid particle and the solid surface at the wall at the solid surface is 0. So, therefore, for a static solid surface static duct, so fluid velocity at the wall is 0. So, therefore, very near to the wall adjacent to the wall fluid velocities are very small. So, the small velocity fluid particles do not have sufficient kinetic energy to make their total energy compatible for flowing from upstream to downstream section. So, therefore, they become unable to surmount the adverse pressure yield. Instead, what they do? They follow the favorable pressure gradient. That means, 
they follow the path from a higher pressure to lower pressure. That means, in a direction opposite to the direction of the bulk flow, which is away from the solid wall. So, therefore, you will see that the fluid particles near the wall goes on flowing in opposite direction, a flow reversal takes place. So, this localized flow reversal makes a recirculatory flow and forms in terms of fluid eddies. And this fluid eddies, a recirculatory loop along with the main bulk flow causes a loss of energy. This loss of energy mechanism is like that a pressure energy, a part of mechanical energy is converted into intermolecular energy, which we call as a loss of energy from the viewpoint of mechanical energy. As you know, when we deal with the mechanical energy, you have already heard this term loss of energy in Bernoulli's equation. Energy can never be lost from the conservation of energy principle, which means a part of mechanical energy which is converted to other form of energy, which is not the mechanical energy, we call it as a loss of energy. That means, this is a loss of mechanical energy due to friction because of the formation of eddies due to a recirculatory reverse flow at the solid wall, why the fluid particles cannot surmount the adverse pressure yield because of their low velocity. This is a very important phenomena of separation. Wherever you come across flow through divergent duct or decelerating flow, this type of phenomena comes known as boundary layer separation. To avoid this or to keep this to a minimum value, the most important factor is that the angle of divergence or rather the rate of diffusion that is change in pressure or the change in velocity has to be made very low. Usual recommendation is that the angle should be within 8 degrees, 8 to 10 degrees to avoid the boundary layer separation as much as possible. So, therefore, we see that in designing a any divergent duct in any application, it is not always for a fluid machines that there are two criteria comes into picture. One is the uh, loss due to boundary layer separation, 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 loss due to boundary layer separation. Another, another is friction loss, frictional loss, frictional loss. And one thing you must know at this level that these two losses are the consequence of viscosities. If the fluid is ideal, neither of these losses will take place. So, you must clear your basic concept in fluid mechanics along with the additional informations in fluid machine that losses due to boundary layer separation and friction loss takes place because of the fluid viscosity. Why? Because the phenomena may occur, but the boundary layer separation will not take place even if there is an adverse pressure in because the fluid particle having a low velocity at wall depends upon the interaction between the fluid and the solid surface through the viscosity of the fluid. So, these are contributed by the viscosity of the fluid. Now, the basic intention of designing any draft tube is to keep this loss two losses to a minimum value, so that the energy is not lost, where we want to retain the energy in the form of mechanical energy. Similar will be the considerations for using or providing draft tubes in a reaction turbine. Well, let us see what are the different types of reaction turbines usually incorporated in practice. Number one is straight type, you can read it, this is straight type. This is a simple conical, the first term of a cone a simple divergent duct, straight divergent duct, the angle included angle is limited to 8 degree, the semi angle is 4 degree. This type of conical draft tube, this is a vertical one, it is directly attached to the outlet end of the runner. It is very efficient and its efficiency lies between almost equal to 80 percent. In this connection, I must tell what is efficiency. The efficiency you can define of a draft tube or any divergent duct in transforming the pressure energy to velocity energy rather velocity energy to pressure energy like this the inlet head inlet head that means total energy at inlet per unit weight minus head lost in the flow divided by the inlet head for an ideal fluid this efficiency is 100 percent that means it is an index of the head loss the efficiency is high means the loss of head by these two mechanisms will be low. So, therefore, this type of machine gives almost 80 percent, 80 or I feel 80 to 90 percent efficiency and these are used for small specific speed, low relatively low NST specific speed turbines with vertical shaft. Now, another type of draft tube, these two types are elbow types. Now, these elbow types draft tubes are used 
where sometimes uh, in certain places sometimes we see that to reduce the cost of excavation particularly in rocks we use this elbow type drop tube where if we go for a vertical drop tube from a from the place where the runner is installed at a height from the tail rest level we see that we have to go for excavation in rock so to keep the cost of excavation minimum the drop tube is bent in the horizontal direction to keep its length it is very uh, uh, it can be seen very clearly in this figure so it is this is known as elbow type that is from vertical to horizontal because of the sharp change in the direction of the flow the efficiency of this type of uh, drop tube is in the order of 60 percent sometimes the cross sectional area is changed from a circular at the inlet to a rectangular rectangular at the outlet to minimize the frictional losses so that the efficiency is little higher so in practice several types of drop tubes are used so you see the angle of the drop tube is limited that is diverges angle by the flow separation loss and the length of the drop tube is being compromised within the friction between the frictional loss in the draft tube and providing the length suitably either in the vertical direction or horizontal direction depending upon the places of application whether to reduce the cost of excavation in rocks we have to place a horizontal part we have to incorporate a horizontal part where the vertical part of the inlet portion has to be bent with the horizontal part in sacrificing certain amount of loss by the change in direction now after this i will come to another very important phenomena cavitation in a fluid machines now cavitation this word as applied to the fluid flow is not necessarily restricted to fluid machines or a reaction machines this is applied to any fluid flow problem or to any hydraulic circuit probably you have heard the name cavitation while reading the siphon in your basic fluid mechanics class while you have read the siphon you have seen that the pressure becomes low at some points in the siphon where the problem of cavitation comes what is cavitation now let us define the cavitation in this way that if there is an hydraulic circuit that means the circuit which contains the flow of a liquid and if there is any chance of having pressure lower than the atmospheric pressure at some part or during in some region of the flow of that hydraulic circuit so one in that case in that case one has to be very careful that this pressure that the minimum pressure which is below the atmospheric pressure should not fall to the vapor pressure below the vapor pressure or equals to the vapor pressure of the liquid at the working temperature why if the minimum pressure in the hydraulic circuit falls to the vapor pressure of the liquid at the working temperature liquid starts boiling at that pressure so when liquid starts boiling so pockets of vapor liquid vapor will be formed which will simply lock the flow or stop the flow this is precisely what is known as cavitation what happens there after is that when the vapors are formed where the pressure is sufficiently low they are carried away with the liquid to a high pressure region where the vapor collapses or bursts forming into cavities and the liquid from surrounding zone rush to fill up the cavities and if this phenomena bursting of the vapors takes place very near to the wall and liquid from the surrounding region rushes to fill up the cavities they causes an erosion effect to the wall of the tube or wall of the duct causing damage the damage is found in the form of pores in the wall of the duct or wall of the tube so therefore it is dangerous to allow such phenomena to occur not only the flow will be stopped within few minutes the wall of the duct or the duct itself or the tube itself of the hydraulic circuit that part of the tube will be damaged will be worn out so this phenomena is known as cavitation so therefore we will have to have a check at the minimum pressure section or the point of the hydraulic circuit so that the pressure at that point should not should be at least more than the vapor pressure of the liquid corresponding to its existing temperature similar is the case for a drop tube now if you write the bernoulli's equation as i discussed earlier at the inlet to the drop tube and the outlet from the drop tube let us consider the inlet where the pressure is p minimum because we know that in a draft tube this minimum pressure will occur at the inlet to the draft tube that means at the outlet of the runner then i can write the equation like that 
p minimum by rho g, let v is the velocity there. That means, this v is the velocity coming out from the runner outlet or this v is the velocity at the inlet to the drum tube. Let z is the vertical height from a reference datum which is usually taken as the tail race. That means, this is the height from the tail race to the inlet of the draft tube. That means, this is the height at which the runner is placed. This I can write is equal to P A by rho g because the outlet pressure of the draft tube is the atmospheric pressure. Draft tube discharges liquid into atmosphere. Now, if we neglect the velocity at the outlet end of the draft tube, we can neglect it if we consider the draft tube's cross sectional area is such that its velocity at the outlet is negligibly small compared to its inlet. Then the datum rate is 0 because we have taken the reference datum at the tail rest level itself. Then another term is this head loss H f that is the loss in energy due to friction and boundary layer separation or due to the change in direction. So, it consists of all the losses in course of flow through the drop tube. So, here we see that P minimum by rho g is equal to P a by rho g minus v square by 2 g plus z plus h f. So, we see that if the velocity at discharge from the runner or at inlet to the draft tube is very high or the height at which the runner is placed from the tail raise level is very high, there is every chance that the minimum pressure at the suction may fall below the vapor pressure because the minimum pressure will depend upon this quantity. More is the velocity at the inlet to the draft tube, more is the height of the runner from the tail less level, less is the pressure at the inlet to the draft tube. Of course, the friction makes an advantageous case in uh, advantageous case in this situation for the P minimum, but the frictional loss is very less as compared to the total energy V square by 2 g plus z. The friction puts a sort of resistance. You can understand physically this way, sir. Why you may ask that friction increases the pressure because friction puts a sort of resistance to the flow, frictional loss, so that the upstream pressure is somewhat increased. So, the influence of friction here is favorable as far as the reduction in the P minimum is required. Now, the basic consideration for cavitation not to occur is P minimum should be greater than PV, that means the vapor pressure of the liquid used. Now, what happens in practice is like that if I write this equation, that equation little here itself in a different manner, we can write with a little other form with an another form rearrangement V square by 2 g is P A uh, by rho g minus P mean by rho g. Well, plus h f or rather v square by 2 g minus h f is written p a. A little rearrangement is made minus p mean by rho g well minus z. Now, this part is expressed in practice as a function of the head across the runner that function is sigma c. So, let us express this way you can see this then we can write that sigma c becomes equal to becomes equal to P a by rho g minus P minimum by rho g minus z by h. This sigma c is known as critical cavitation parameter, critical cavitation parameter, critical cavitation parameter, critical cavitation parameter and it is an operating condition of the turbine which depends upon the minimum pressure at the runner outlet, the height at which the runner has to be installed and the head across the machine. Another parameter sigma is defined according to a German scientist Thoma is known as Thoma's cavitation parameter, which is used as a design criteria or a design parameter 
to determine whether the cavitation will occur in a particular situation or not. What is this? This is simply the same thing almost, but instead of P minimum, we substitute the criteria that is the vapor pressure, which is the limiting value by H. That means, in under all situations, cavitation to avoid this P minimum has to be more than PV, which means sigma has to be greater than sigma C to avoid cavitation. Well, to avoid cavitation, what is done in practice that this sigma is calculated Thomas cavitation parameter with the vapor pressure of the liquid and under the operating conditions sigma c is calculated and it is checked that whether sigma is greater than sigma c or not. Now, you see if the head of the runner is increased or the height of the runner from the tail less level is increased sigma is reduced and there is a chance of cavitation to occur. Usually what is done in practice that from this equation the maximum value of z is calculated. That means, let us write the z max that is the maximum height of the runner that means, the maximum height at which the turbine runner can be placed will be sigma rather I can write this way P a by rho g when the P minimum will reach P v P v by rho g minus sigma c into a. That means, this equation gives z is equal to P a by rho g minus P minimum by rho g minus sigma c h. So, when P minimum will reach P v that is the vapor pressure which will give the maximum z. So, the values of sigma c the operating parameters are known to us in case of design while we design the turbine. So, knowing the value of sigma c we find out what is the maximum z that is required. Now, sometime it appears that when H is very high that means, turbine operating under a very very high head that means, a low specific speed Z max is reduced. Sometimes it appears that Z max may be negative that is turbine has to be placed below the tail water level. The situation is not so this is because the sigma C here is a function of is a function of specific speed of the turbine. I give you an example that if we plot the values of sigma c which are available to the design engineers in practice with NST, the values are like this for a Francis turbine, Francis. For a Kaplan turbine, it is like this, Kaplan turbine. Now, it is found for a Francis turbine, the values of sigma c is a direct function of the specific speed. So, when the head is high, specific speed equation n p to the power half by h to the power 5 by 4. That means, at a higher head the specific speed is low. So, therefore, we do not go for a Kaplan turbine rather we go for a Francis turbine where we find at a lower specific speed these all specific speed range for the reaction turbines only. At lower specific speed the values of sigma c is also low. So, that if we employ the value of sigma c even at a higher rate we get a value of z max which may not be negative. So, the difficulties can be avoided that turbine may not be set at a level below the tail less water level, but the height above the tail less water level must be very small not very high to avoid the cavitation. Well, so this is about all uh, this is all about the cavitation in a reaction turbine. So, if you have any questions you can ask me. So, today up to this only. Well, please, any question? Okay, please. Cavitation, principle of draft tube and the cavitation, which is very important parameter. Cavitation is a very important parameter in designing any hydraulic circuits where there is a chance of pressure within the circuit to fall below the atmospheric pressure. So, you must know this thing. Any question? Okay, thank you. <coughs>